Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to 2 Kings chapter 10, in which there are 36 verses. Beginning in verse 1, we see that Jehu wrote a letter, verses letters. And then it says here, uh, to the rulers of Samaria versus the rulers of Jezreel. And then it says here uh, in verse 2, arms versus armor. So arms could be weapons. Armor is not weapons. Equipment, okay, military equipment. Um, in verse 3, there's a footnote regarding the word uh, fittest, the best and fittest. Uh, the Greek means upright or unblemished. In verse 5, there's an omission of also. We also are your servants. Uh, we will do that which is right in thine eyes. Uh, versus do thou good in thine eyes. So why is that important? Uh, that omission that I brought up. <clears throat> because uh, they're pointing out we are also your servants, not that uh, we are your servants. They are pointing out that if you look at just the narrative, they feared greatly and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him. How shall we stand so that they so so they that were over the house, they that were over the city, and the elders and the guardians? So they sent back a uh, reply to Jehu saying, We also are your servants. Don't forget. And whatsoever you shall say to us, we will do. On the other hand, in the Masoretic, it reads as such. So they responded, <clears throat> He that was over the house, uh, the bringers up of children, sent to Jehu, saying, We are your servants, and will do all that you shall bid us. So I don't know if you can pick up pick up on the subtlety, the subtle difference we are your servants. Whereas in the Septuagint, it seems like they are making a like a reminder. They're trying to remind him, we're also your servants. Um, I don't know. I, I think it just <laughs> seemed like a subtle difference, but it was enough to warrant a mention anyway. So moving on, <clears throat> uh, verse 6. If ye are for me, versus if ye be mine. So another subtle difference. Jehu responding to the guardian saying, If you are for me, if you support me, versus if you be mine, that you know, he owns them, essentially. <clears throat> verse 10. See now these heads, referring to the heads that uh, were brought to him, versus no now. So we can see, no, he's saying, look at these heads, not just know something. Verse 11, acquaintance versus kinsfolks. Uh, so it's an interesting word that they use. Why would they say acquaintance? Could that include his kinfolks? Um, to know, to be acquainted with. Okay, so in all fairness, it could, could also be interpreted as uh, acquaintance. Verse 13, found versus met. So why is this important? Jehu happened to meet the brethren of Ahaziah. He didn't seek them out. They didn't plan to meet in advance because we can see his statement to them, who are you? If he was planning to meet with them, he, would, he wouldn't even ask, who are you? Um, <clears throat> sons versus children in the same verse. Verse 14, there's an addition of they took them alive. 
and an addition of the pit of the shearing house. So the pit of was added. Verse 15, we have an omission of, and Jehu said. So it's important to know who's speaking. Uh, and then it says here, saluted. Saluted. He saluted him. In the Greek, it means blessed him. Verse 16, sit versus ride. Verse 17, there's an omission of utterly destroyed. Now, this is important because when something is destroyed, yes, it they're defeated or part of their forces have been uh, eliminated. But when something is utterly destroyed, this means completely exterminated without a trace remaining. Verse 19, everyone who shall be missing versus let none be waiting. Uh, servants versus worshipers. Verse 20, sanctify versus proclaim. And verse 21, significant difference, the omission uh, of the following, saying, is the saying, saying, now then, let all servants and all his priests and all his prophets come, let none be lacking. For I am going to offer a great sacrifice, where whosoever shall be missing shall not live. So all the servants of this name came, and all his priests and all his prophets. All right, verse 22. House of the wardrobe versus over the vestry. And we see robe versus vestments. Verse 24. He versus they. So he went in. That was Jehu. Uh, and then verse 26. Pillar versus images. 27 pillar versus image. Um, and then fourth house, which is a draught house, can mean a sewer, an outhouse, a lavatory, a latrine, essentially a public toilet. Verse 28, abolished versus destroyed. Verse 29, I have a, just a thought to share in regards to verse 29. Notice how Jehu departed not from following the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who led Israel to sin. In fact, he let the golden heifers in Bethel and in Dan remain, which would beg the question, why would Hashem allow that and not warn him? Where, so we see here, Hashem is not calling him out on this. So even in our own lives, those of us who try to do what is pleasing in the eyes of Hashem to follow the Torah, to the letter of the law, to the spirit of the law. What are the golden heifers in our lives that Hashem is not bringing to our attention? That he's not calling us out on? Uh, that are fundamentally wrong? We have to really ask that question of ourselves. Uh, verse 30, sons versus children. Verse 31, there's an omission of a following. I, I bring this up because one does not simply walk into Mordor. <laughs> no, that's, that's the meme. One does not simply walk upon or stumble accidentally into the sins of Jeroboam. One has to purposely pursue and follow them. So that is why I bring that up. That's why it's significant. Verse 33, an omission of, uh, it says, of Gadi, of Gadi. And I think that's about it for this chapter, but I wanted to cover an important aspect of the story. Uh, I was going to title this video after a movie uh, in Hollywood by Quentin Tarantino called Inglorious. I don't want to say the full word, but it starts with a B. 
And that's what this chapter kind of reminds me of because we see this plot of Jehu where he really pulls in all the followers of this false Elohim, B-A-A-L, the prophets of him, the servants, the priests, everyone who follows him essentially, and deceives the people, making it seem like he is for them. And since he's the leader of that nation, why would they resist, right? They're going to make it as pomp and bombast as possible. They're going to prepare a big feast. Everyone will be there, certainly. No one will not be there. And he even gave an express command that anyone who does not show up will essentially be put to death or will lose their lives. See, everyone who shall be missing shall die. But he did it in subtlety and in... in uh, in cunning. So let's look at that word, akba, for subtlety. It reminds me of the, the serpent of all things. Subtlety, insidiousness, craftiness. This is trickery. Not all trickery is bad. It depends what is the purpose of the trickery. Is it to bring glory to Hashem? Is it to uh, eliminate evil? Or is it to propagate evil, to cause others to sin, to go against Hashem? So we see that this subtlety, this uh, trickery is being used for good. Uh, we see that throughout the scriptures, even with uh, the two spies who were being uh, hidden by the prostitute, the Moabite. Uh, and Jehu said, sanctify a solemn festival. So they did that. And then notice everyone, they all filled up the house, was filled up, and he had... 80 men who were killers outside. Uh, 80 men outside and said, everyone who shall escape the life of him, whoever escapes, or I should say the man who lets him go, whoever escapes, your life will be in exchange for the one who escapes. So don't let anyone out. And so nobody was allowed to escape. So it reminds me of that movie of Quentin Tarantino where they brought all the the Nazis essentially into a movie theater and they locked the doors and you know they had a big event and they essentially eliminated everybody who was trying to escape. You know, they set the place on fire and so on. But here we see they used the edge of the sword. Uh and they were, yeah, it says they burnt it. Well, they burnt the pillar. I'm not sure if they burnt the place. In any case, that is quite a story. And it was just exciting to read this, uh, this narrative from start to finish. Uh, really stands out, makes the book of Kings, uh, you know, from first Kings, second Kings. These are some of the most exciting uh, literature ever written, in my opinion. So that's all for this chapter, and thank you very much for your time. So until next time, I bid you all Shalom Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Irini Mazisu, Pax Wobiskam. Peace be unto you, Shabbat Shalom and Miranath.